Oh, God, good, you're here. I am so excited. Guess what? Uh, I hope this isn't about your podcast again. Why? Did you finally listen to it? Da 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 The Grooming Next Door Production. The 1970s and 80s had elbow, gravy train, perina, meow mix, and bell bottoms. You've changed your clothes, now change how you feed your pet. Like bell bottoms, kick the kibble and join us in the 21st century with the healthiest diet for dogs and cats. Feed naturally, feed raw, feed fetching food. Hello, pups and kittens, and welcome to another fun-filled and informative episode of The Groomer Next Door. I'm your host, Chris Green, and joining us this week is Ann Carlson. She has a really unique company that blew my mind called Jiminy's. You know, I've always been very much interested in nutrition, and as we all know with the previous experience with plant-based diet, it really had sparked a kind of a, a little nerve in my brain going, hey, we got to be able to do more than just plant-based. What else can we do? Well, Anne's come up with a treat that actually has, and I know this is going to sound a little weird to some people, but crickets. And we're going to go over all of that in just a moment when she joins us. I think it's absolutely amazing and something that really should spark a great deal of interest. But let's get to our fact of the week. A recent study shows that dogs are among a small group of animals who show voluntary unselfish kindness towards others without any reward. This is one fact dog lovers have known all along. I definitely can concur on that one. Well, by that sound, Anne is about to enter the podcast studio. So, with that said, welcome Anne Carlson from Jiminy's. Hello. Hold on a sec. Dad, we have a guest on the podcast. This week on the podcast, we are joined by somebody who really has intrigued my mind. And kind of to the point where I'm just going, why aren't we doing more of this? It's brilliant. It makes so much sense. It's 100% holistic. And I just completely have to thank you for sitting down and talking with us. This week we have Ann Carlson, and she has an amazing company called Jiminy. So thank you for being on the podcast. Oh, Chris, thank you for having me. You know, it's it's funny. Um, we had a, a conversation before we we started recording. Of uh, I want to say about a week ago or something like that. Mm-hmm. And ever since that conversation, I have not stopped reading about insect base and why we're not doing more, and almost to the point where. You know, people in the U.S. are really, honestly, just missing the ball here. This is brilliant. <laughs> well, I'm glad you feel that way. Uh, I feel the same. <laughs> but yeah. you know what it is? is it's, it's just new. Uh, yeah. It's, it's not new when you go to other countries. It's just here in the U.S. We've always had plenty of, you know, sort of traditional agriculture um, available to us. But things are changing, and we need to start to really think about um, what we're using as a food source. I think that we have to think about sustainability as we go forward. That is completely accurate. There is nothing more accurate than that. And I think the one thing that, that you always have to look into is the fact that it's not just sustainable and holistic, but it meets every ounce of it's humane, (laughs) <laughs> There's so much benefits to it. And it's not like, oh, we're going to take a, a cow and it's only going to be alive for a year, juice it up, and then slaughter it. We're talking about something that has six weeks life cycle. Yep. That's what makes it humane as well. Right. We like to say it's delicious, nutritious, sustainable, humane. Um, and if there's more to it than that, it's great for dogs with allergies. Uh, mm-hmm. You don't have the same safety concerns. It's just, it's, it's pretty amazing as you start to dig into it. It is. Well, let's, let's go with the origin story because that's where I always like to, to start with everything because it always has to be that moment in life where you go, 
aha, I have a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> How did Jiminy's begin? Well, you know, I, I've spent my entire career in the consumer packaged goods industry uh, over 25 years. And, um, but the, but the last eight were in the pet industry. Uh, I worked for Big Heart Pet, and I left after the Smucker acquisition. Mm. Uh, I wanted to stay in California, and, you know, Smuckers is in Ohio. And, uh, you know, I was trying to decide what I wanted to do next, and I got approached by a, a guy who actually is my partner now, uh, and he wanted me to lead a pet treats company for him, and his idea was that we would use grass-fed, grass-finished beef. And I, I, I liked the idea of doing something that was sustainable because it's, it has absolutely been missing in the pet industry. Um, but I, cow is not the answer. Uh, cows, no matter which way you look at it, even if they're grass-fed, grass-finished, they're just not that sustainable. So we started poking around at this idea of what, what would be a sustainable protein that could really be different. And I started looking at insects, and the more I looked at it, the more I was intrigued and kind of fell in love with it because it not only um, it fit the bill as far as sustainability, but it turns out it's a true superfood as well. Mm -hmm. um, just amazing when you start digging into, you know, that, that it's got the protein. It's, it's got higher protein, actually, than beef or chicken. Uh, omegas, fiber, vitamin B2, B12, that's high in iron, calcium, magnesium, potassium. It's just, it's just terrific. Um, but it also had the sustainability and I, I love that as well. Um, you know, when you start looking at the dogs in the U.S., dogs in the U.S. are eating 32 billion pounds of protein per year. And when you think about doing that with traditional uh, animal agriculture, it is absolutely not sustainable. The amount of land, the amount of water, the greenhouse gas emissions, mm -hmm. it's its terrible. Um, replacing it with something that's sustainable is not not only, you know, a good thing, it just, it absolutely makes sense. And it, you know, it's, it's so funny because one of the things that crossed my mind is, of course, you know, being a vegetarian, I don't want to eat anything really except for I'll have fish and I'll have some chicken and that's that's even questionable it has to be specific cage free and I really have to, to know a little bit more but you know I always think to myself well wait a second if you're vegan this actually could work too because it's not like you're actually going out there and saying okay here's a cricket squish and I'm going to kill it it's actually lived probably all of its life or majority of those six weeks is that something a vegan would actually be like, okay, I can get behind this? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I've had um, some vegans who say yes and some that say no. It kind of depends on why they became a vegan in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of probe around that and say, you know, is, is it because you're worried about water usage? Is it because you're worried about sustainability? Um, or is it that you just can't take a life no matter what? Mm -hmm. Um some even will ask questions about, you know, can insects feel pain? And, uh, you know, if you if you talk to an entomologist, they'll say, no, not in the same way that you think of pain. So, you know, a lot of them are okay with it uh, because of those reasons. That's really interesting. You know, especially, you know, as, as I went through the whole plant-based diet series and really dug into that, I really, you know, touched on the whole vegan process. And, of course... I was able to find out that there was a lot of vegetarians and vegans who are saying, look, I, I get it. It's, you know, my, my dog, my cat, they're cardboard omnivore, so I can't, I, you know, I have to, you know, abide by their needs. And of course, there's a lot of vegans out there like, no, 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 no. I, there's a plant base and I'm going to go that way and I'm not going to be here to judge. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really interesting to, because I did see that whole water usage and I thought that was really interesting. You're, your statistics that you have on your website is just, it's, it's interesting and so much to ingest and I enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's pretty amazing. I, I love the water usage. I live in California and, uh, we're, we're, you know, every other year or more, we're in a <laughs> drought. So, you know, water, water is just so important. And, um, 
I don't, I don't know if you read about South Africa right now, but they're, they're in a really bad place mm-hmm. and, uh, limiting the amount of water per person. And, you know, they're basically out. So we have to take this really seriously. And one of the things we did is we compared our water usage versus, uh, say a traditional beef treat. So a, a, ba- a six ounce bag of our treats, um, if you compare it to a six ounce bag of beef treats, we save 250 gallons of water just by converting to cricket as the protein source. That's a lot. That's huge. 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 You know, what's funny is I grew up my entire life in California. I've only been in the Midwest for going on eight years. So I remember it's, it's, even when it's rainy, they go, well, it's pouring rain and we still need, you know, 17 more years of this constant before we're actually back out of our, off of our drought. Yet, you see sprinklers going off on everybody's house, even when it's uh, raining. Drives yeah. me nuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's less of that than there was, but, um, but yeah, some people are still not quite conscious of what's going on with the water. Right. It's, it's scary. And, um, you know, I, one of the reasons I did this is because I wanted to try to help make a difference. And, right. you know, you, you look at all the problems in the world and you pick out something that you feel passionately about. And for me, it's, it's around this, this area of climate change. What can we do that is going to help? And um, embracing a, a different food source, I think, is a really important way to go. If you look at a sort of traditional animal agriculture, it is a huge part of the problem today. Um, there's there's a lot of numbers on it. I, I saw this documentary called Cowspiracy that really talks to it. Um, but it is contributing more to climate change than uh, transportation and um, energy. So, so when you start looking at it, you say, you know, that's a place where we could really make a difference. And you know what? You're you're making that difference. Um, how many crickets do you use per biscuit? <laughs> per biscuit, it's a little over five. Really? Um, yep, yep. Uh, because what what happens is, uh, you know, the crickets are they're they're raised in a barn. It's it's not like we're going out with a big net and trying to collect these things. <laughs> we're raising them very intentionally, and. Um, when they reach the end of their life cycle, they they lower the temperature, so it's very humane. They go into hibernation, and then they're they're frozen. They get uh, washed and roasted, and then ground up. So it's the entire the entire cricket gets ground up into a protein powder, hmm. and we bake with that protein powder. So our treats, uh, the the treats that we have right now, we've got a new one coming up, but the ones right now are all biscuits. And the cricket protein is just baked right into it. So no worries, folks. You don't have to, you know, take it out of the bag and see a cricket <laughs> hanging out on there. Yeah, no no antenna, no legs, nothing sticking out. Actually, uh, a lot of times we'll tell people, look, look at this. It looks like any other biscuit. Um, it smells good. It has sort of a nutty smell. And, and actually, I, well, I, you know, I've eaten the crickets, the roasted crickets straight. So I, I've actually gone ahead and popped that whole bug in my mouth. And quite frankly, if you close your eyes and do it the first time, you get over it really quickly. But it tastes like sunflower seeds. It's, hmm. It doesn't have, um, it, it's not weird. It's It tastes nutty. Man, I don't know. I, I can do it in the biscuit, but I don't know if I could do it just straight up. I, I don't know. Well, like I said, the first time I did it, I closed my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't blame you. I mean, you know, we were talking about this before we even recorded it. It was, it was funny because you think about chocolate covered ants, you, you talk about different kinds of insects that are actually eight. And it's like, I was going through it, you know, my, my research and I was like, in countries like South America and Africa, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, they have over a thousand different species of insects. Yeah, that, that I think actually, it's nineteen hundred actually really? that are that are edible. Yep. Man, can you but, think about but, that? Oh yeah, I mean, there's so many different things, and they have different taste profiles, and some of them have a little bit more fat. So you know, it's. I think we are going to 
be exploring this for years to come. We started with crickets because everybody calls it the gateway bug. <laughs> it's, kind of the, it, it's the easiest to wrap your head around. It doesn't have a weird name. Some people are working with mealworms, and I think people have a really hard time with the, the idea of eating anything that's called a worm. Yeah. Um, cricket's a lot easier. And especially in the form that we're doing it, where it's, it's just, it looks like a flower. And see, that makes sense. And what's really great, because a lot of concerns are on whole, you know, with the whole grain issue, and you guys are grain free. And yes, then, yeah. It was really important to us that we carefully selected all of the ingredients that went into the product. And in fact, we put, um, a lot of the ingredients right on the front panel. In fact, 85% of what's in the bag is on the front panel. So exactly. if you, like, for instance, if you look at our sweet potato and apple recipe, crickets is the first ingredient, then lentils, sweet potato, flaxseed, peanut butter, and apple. So it's, it's really good ingredients. It's all human grade. And we're making it in small batches as well. So, um, and made in the USA. We make them in Golden, Colorado. So it's, you know, it's, it's very wholesome. Wholesome and holistic. I would, again, exactly. Th these are the two things that actually make the biggest difference to me. I, I don't know how much more of this I can talk about when it comes to nutrition. It's just like this big thing that I, almost on a daily basis, for a long time would drive my wife nuts. Now she's completely in on this, head first right in on it. But I, I just think about it. I'm like, our dogs are eating and our cats are eating garbage all the time. It's like going to fast food yeah. places. Yeah, if you look at the ingredient list, it's pretty scary sometimes. And you did dodge a bullet <laughs> on not taking that job and going with Smuckers, especially right around <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This has been a bad month for recalls. I think there were five so far this month, and we're only halfway through the month. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's rough. I don't, you know, when you, when you play with dangerous ingredients, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. And that's one of the things about the insects that, um, we're starting to talk about more is that, um, they're, the way we're doing it, we're raising them in clean indoor farms and they're free from common pathogens that plague the meat industry. Things like, you know, E. coli, staph, um, listeria, salmonella which is, you know, several of the ones this month are that. Right. Um, it's just not going to happen with this type of protein. Well, protein and vitamins and minerals and everything else. I know. I know. It's, it goes beyond what you think of in a normal protein. I mean, the fact that it has fiber, mm -hmm. that's, that's really unusual. And, you know, we're... We're just at the, the beginning of this, right? So we're working through and we're doing some work with AFCO right now. Um, but we believe that there's going to be more that we're going to find out about crickets that is exciting and things that we're going to be able to claim. We're, we're digging into things like a probiotic effect in, or prebiotic effect that happens uh, when they digest the crickets. They've done some in vitro work already. We're working with Iowa State University and um, and really investigating a, a lot of different areas that I think in the future we're going to be able to put on the front of the bag as claims. And see that, again, you know, but like everything else, I mean, you can continue to do the research. It's it's getting the word out there that drives the, the biggest thing. Yeah, it's a huge education process. Yep. We spend a lot of time explaining to people, you know, what is this thing that we're doing? Why are we doing it? Um, a lot of people do get it, though, now, because there's a lot of uh, products that are coming out for people. And, and that's been helpful for us because it helps with the education. I, there's um, exo bars and um, there, there's uh, some pasta. There's uh, chips. So a lot of different products are coming out that contain crickets. And actually, kind of a funny story, our, when we were going to do our first production run, we had ordered our cricket protein. Well, two of the companies that make products for people went on Shark Tank, mm -hmm. <laughs> and their demand exploded, mm -hmm. and they used up all the cricket protein. So we had to wait for them to grow new crickets for us. So we were six weeks delayed because of wow. the Shark Tank effect. 
Yeah. But, but that's all helpful for us because it's people learning about cricket as a protein source. Well, you know, as long as you have an open mind and realize that there, this is not just a, you it's a bug. It's more of a, hey, there's a lot of benefits to this and let's start to expand the science here. That's yes, definitely. What, that's the hard part. I don't think a lot of people realize that there's a great deal of benefits. Which, yeah, just so many benefits. It's, it's exciting. Uh, we didn't even talk about allergies. That's what I was going to um, say. What are the benefits? <laughs> well, well, you know, when I talk about the benefits, I start with dogs like it. <laughs> I like that. That's, that's kind of important. And, you know, we did, we did a lot of testing to make sure that was the case. I even started the first time I ever gave the dogs anything with cricket. I just gave them whole roasted crickets to see if they would go for it. And... um but they, the dogs love it, and um, you, you can see it. There's some videos on YouTube of, of my dogs eating it, and it's pretty hysterical. But then nutritious. The nutrition is important. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's most important. Uh, what, one of the things we made sure as we were making the treats, too, is that we considered how, how much each cookie, uh, how many calories each cookie had. Uh, because we've got a problem with dog obesity. And so we tried to get under 10 calories per cookie, and we were able to achieve that because it's not only is it high protein, but it's low calorie. So that that's great. And they're actually designed so you can break them in two and have multiple feeding occasions per cookie. Um, and then sustainable. We talked about that it, using exponentially less resources. It's less land, water, feed. and hardly any greenhouse gas emissions from crickets, which is fantastic as well. Humane. And then uh, great for dogs with allergies. So, um, you know, beef, chicken, lamb, soy, even fish are some of the most common ingredients that trigger dog allergies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're working with uh, several veterinarians right now. And one of them is recommending our treats when they put a dog on an elimination diet. Because the cricket protein is not an allergen, and it's, it's kind of funny she, when she was talking about it. She said most of the time, uh, the, the human follows the elimination diet to a T until they get to the treats. And then they <laughs> forget, and they give like a beef treat or something like that, and it, it wrecks the whole thing. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so they're recommending our treats uh, to, to keep them on course. You know what else I find to be a, a real issue is dental treats. Have you ever looked at some of the companies and what's inside of there? Yeah, yeah. It's it's tough. Uh, the ingredients there are really tricky. Mm -hmm. uh, having worked for a company that did it, um, you know, and, and you know, you don't even know what the, the, quite what the efficacy is on the, the, uh, the treat itself because, you know, they're, they're claiming it's going to clean the teeth and, and it does to a certain extent, but it's, it's some chemicals that are added oftentimes that are actually doing the cleaning. And there's weeds and grains. Yep. Yep. There's all of that. Uh, well, they have to make it, you know, so that it's a longer lasting chew, mm -hmm. uh, in order for it to actually do what it's supposed to do. And cat is even funnier because, <laughs> um, you know, cats don't chew the same way. Mm -hmm. They're true carnivores. Mm -hmm. And so to, to actually, have an impact on them, you need to do something completely different. It's it's all very strange. I mean, again, though, it always comes back to one thing, and that's the science. Mm -hmm. And you, you trust what the, the company is selling, and that's, you know, unfortunately, that's kind of where we're at, where a lot of people are at right now, where it's like, oh, I'm trusting them because their name is so massive. So how can I ever go wrong? They wouldn't be massive if they weren't, you know, good. Well, that's not the case, but, you know, and then you uh, you have good companies like Jiminy's who are making a product that actually is, in a sense, just rewinding some of the negative that's unfortunately been processed through these poor dogs and cats over the years in such a holistic way. And it, I look at my cats, if a, a spider ever comes in, that's their favorite <laughs> thing. Let's go have something to eat. Yeah, uh, we we fully intend to get to the cats. We started with dogs, but um, the cats are you know are they're on our roadmap. <laughs> cats cats are tricky though. They uh, 
you know, it's it's not just about the flavor. It's mm-hmm. also about the shape and the texture. And yeah, they're, they're sometimes they're hard to work with because of that. There's so many different uh, aspects of, of trying to make something that's palatable for them. Mm-hmm. I imagine it had to have some kind of fish flavor because mm-hmm. most of my cats are just like, oh, well, my, mine really like the beef and they really like the fish. So it's really kind of tricky with them. But. Yeah, well, we have had some cats who have actually, well, the, for the very first time I was showing the treats to my in-laws, I put them on the table, and their cat jumped up and just started eating the treats. So um, I'm kind of excited because I think that we might have something here that's going to appeal to them uh, pretty easily. But I, I just know that from my past experiences, the cat is much harder from a palatability perspective than dog. Cats are very tricky. I mean, yep. there's just nothing about it. Cats are, they're still one of my favorites to ever, you know, be able to work with. And, and I love having cats around, but man. Yeah, they're awesome, but, but definitely <laughs> hard to, to build a product for. Build a product, make sure they're always happy. I mean, look at, they stress out over the easiest thing ever. So it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. What type of flavor biscuits do you have? Well, we, we launched with three. Uh, So we have the original, which is a pumpkin base, and then the sweet potato and apple that I told you about, and then we have a a peanut butter and blueberry. So we we really thought about each of the the ingredients and and this kind of uh, the flavors to to make sure that every ingredient had a a reason for being there. Um, You know, things like pumpkin are great for their tummy. A lot of the things are great for their tummy that we tried to work with. Um, sweet potatoes, similar as well. Uh, blueberries with the antioxidants. So, you know, all, every ingredient was, there was a reason for including it. We started with a long list that we felt good about and uh, tried not to, to stray from that. My dog loves blueberries, loves sweet potatoes. So I can completely see where those, those alone would just make dogs just go nuts. I don't, I don't know dogs that don't like those ingredients. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that was kind of the point. You try to, like, find good ingredients dogs like. And cricket is always number one or number two ingredient for us as well. So um, there's only one of them where it's the second ingredient, and that's the peanut butter, where peanut butter is the first ingredient. You ever think it's funny that when it comes to making any kind of treat or food for our dogs, we really have to kind of go back to a third, the three-year-old child because it's like, if it's, if they won't eat it, nope, they won't eat that because it's got a vegetable. But if it has a sweet <laughs> smell or something, they're all over it. It's, well, you know, dogs like what we like. They like, um, you know, they love protein, but they like salt and they like sugar. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a, so, so the first thing I do is I always taste it myself. So if if I think it tastes okay, I'm pretty sure my dog is going to think it tastes okay. Well, you think about, I mean, I've never tried it. I never will. But what dry kibble must taste like, and yet, can you just imagine how bad that stuff tastes? Oh, yeah. Yeah, No, I I won't taste that. However, when we make kibble, I will taste ours. It'll be a human-grade ingredient, though. So it would actually work. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we're we're working on a new treat right now. In fact, uh, this morning I got the the first batch sent in the mail, and um, it's going to be a soft and chewy treat, a training treat. Ooh. We've been working with uh, I think you know Ian Dunbar. He created Serious Dog Training. Okay. He's he is an annual animal behavioral specialist, and so we've been working with him a lot on uh, what he's one of our advisors. And what we should be doing from, uh, you know, to, to really fit into that training occasion. And so this new treat will fit in there. But coming back to the little kids, uh, we're, we're working with peas and carrots. Yeah. <laughs> so we're making sort of almost like a baby food kind of uh, flavor. But, uh, but I think it's going to be really fun. It's going to be really fun. Well, you know, I'm, I, I look at, at the fact, especially with dogs, and it's kind of funny with the whole plant base going to that's the whole thing. People are very much like, no, 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 you can't do this. You can't do this. It's like with dogs, they have to have a vegetable in their food. Oh, absolutely. They're an omnivore. And, mm-hmm. you know, 
fiber is important for them. And, you know, the, it, you really need to think through their diet. And, you know, I, I, my dogs are doing just fantastically well with this. And I'm just so excited about where this is going to lead. And, you know, it's, it's funny because I think you, you've done this at the right time. Because even 10 years ago, I don't even know if it was really ready then. I think people were still at that point. I, I think you're right as well. Um, we're, we're, I believe there's a fundamental shift happening right now. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there were a couple of UN studies that are really pushing this forward. Uh, there was one talking about the world's population. It's going to exceed 9 billion by 2050. Mm -hmm. and, and that means that our food production needs to increase, increase by 70%. And when you add in the food needs of our dogs as well, that we definitely need to think differently. Um, there was another UN study that talked about crickets, or well, it said actually insect protein, as potentially being the solution to our food needs. And so you put those kinds of things together, and it does. It feels like yes, this is the time to do this, and and consumers are open to it. I think millennials in particular, uh, they care about sustainability. They care about food origin. You know, all of those things really matter. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the transparency as well. That's, that's kind of what I think yes. we've really focused for. We're honing in on that more than anything else is transparency. Yep. And, and that's the, by putting 85% of our ingredients on the front of the package. That's kind of like, yeah, we, we believe in that as well. You, you, you got to show people what you're putting into the product. We do. And you remember when the whole great system started in California, when that whole movement began, it, that really changed all of our ways of dining out. Ooh, that place doesn't have an A rating. If you would ever, oh, yeah. if you saw a C, you were like, yeah, no, I'm not going in there. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Yeah, the the really, I I don't know if other states have that, but um, you know, when you walk into a, a restaurant here, it's you know, eight and a half by eleven piece of paper mm -hmm. with with that big old letter on it, and you're like, yeah. You know, I'm not walking in a C. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Oh my gosh. I mean, you would never see a D. Um, but no, if I'm pretty sure that one's closed. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm on the verge. I mean, I think I yeah. saw one in my entire life uh, a D, and I was like, and they're still their doors are still open, and people were actually in there, and I was shocked. I was like, wow, yeah, that's you crazy. <laughs> so, so you think about it. I mean, that that's over ten years ago that that happened, and that's really when the movement of transparency really started, and we all were really conscious. Ooh, I need to worry about what I eat. But we're still not there with dogs or cats, which boggles my yeah. mind. Uh, I agree. I, and I, I think there's, there's been a few companies that are pushing, you know, on things like they're putting humane on their package and they're, they're starting to talk sustainability. But I think we're the first ones that are coming with it as a core component of our DNA. Yeah. Cause we, we really, I mean, we, we led with the idea that we had to be different. We had to do things differently. Um, th that we needed to, to think about the sustainability of, of the, the food, food chain mm -hmm. and the food system. So, you know, really, really thinking differently. Thinking differently and, and just saying, okay, I'm not going to do what, you know, especially when it comes to feeding your dogs and cats, I'm not going to do what my parents did. I'm not going to do what my grandparents did. I'm breaking the cycle which is really what that whole, this whole process has always been about. My dad fed this, my, my grandfather oh, yeah. fed it, so I feed it. That, that doesn't yeah. make it right. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, every, I remember as a kid, it was always like, oh, yeah, you get puppy chow because that's what you do. Yeah. But that's not necessarily the case anymore. And, and for us, it's always about the choices because we're, we're always faced with choices, and what we try to do is always make a good choice mm -hmm. and think about, you know, are, are we making the right choice as far as, you know, what is that going to do to the planet and what, you know, are we trying to minimize the amount of resources that we're using? So we're always trying to make those kind of choices. Sometimes it's, it's hard. We, we have to compromise a little bit, but we try, we try to wherever possible not to compromise. And you know, it, I would love, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. 
Oh, I was going to say, I would love to be able to put um, the product into a, a, a bag that was, um, you know, more sustainable, uh, could be, but, you know, we're not there yet. Mm-hmm. We're, we're working towards that. Well, yeah. I mean, well, baby steps, especially, especially when you're starting out, it has to be a baby step. And then you can, you can launch more and more and more as time goes on. Right, and, and as they're, you know, they're able to create those packages that, and then there's work being done against it, so, you know, yeah. all of that will come as well. Right now, though, I'm, everything that goes into the bag, that we can make the right choices on. Absolutely. And what goes in the bag is typically what's going to be coming out of the bag, and that's the main ingredient that needs to be perfect. So that's yes. what matters. Exactly. So do you have a farm that you actually obtain your crickets from, or is it just, is there multiple places that you can go through? Never really understood how that would work, and I'm interested. We're actually working with several. Um, we've got one main one that's up in Canada. They're all North American. Uh, some some people are sourcing from outside of uh, North America, in particular, places like Thailand, mm-hmm. um, you know, South Pacific type, you know, Asia Pacific um, origins, and for us, that just didn't make sense. You know, based on we had all those problems with you know the chicken that came from from China that had problems, and we just didn't even want to go there. And you know, for us, being more local is is better as well from a sustainability perspective. So we're working not only with the Canadian farm, but we're working with um, some here in the Bay Area. Uh, we're, we've also worked with ones across the, the states as well, so Texas and Louisiana. Um, and we'll, we'll continue to do that. And partly we're doing that also so that there's more supply mm-hmm. of crickets um, because it is relatively new here in the states, and we want to support as many of these farms as we possibly can. You know, it's funny because I think a lot of people are almost victimized to one little problem, and that was when Fear Factor was on, and they'd make people eat live bugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's what it all comes down to. People see that. They see these, these screaming beetles or whatever they were, giant cockroaches, screaming giant cockroaches, I think is what it was. Um, and they think that that's what it is, and it's like, no, it's nothing like that. But Oh, yeah. Now, a lot of times we'll walk in and we'll come in with the actual protein powder because it just, it looks like any other ingredient. And you, and you can smell it and look at it and taste it and go, okay, yeah, that's not scary. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny when you think about it. And I even think about it from the scary perspective. And it's like, it's not scary. It's just powder. And yet, <laughs> that's a wild clown that's on a rampage. It's just powder. But, yeah, wow. I didn't think well, about that. For me, it's it's kind of funny that people get so weirded out about it. Um, I, and these are people that are eating hamburgers. And I'm yeah. like, have you ever seen what goes on there? Oh. <laughs> you know, it's, it's much worse. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's what kind of drove me away from eating meat was just the idea. It's like, oh, God, what's in that burger? It just scared me. Especially the Golden Arches. That place really worries me <laughs> more than any of them. Yeah, and it's not just, you know, what can happen to it. It's also, it's just so brutal. Mm. Um, you know, from a, when you think about hum, humane and ethical practices, um, those animals don't get to live very long. Uh, you know, most of them are, are living less than 10% of their natural life and, and in terrible conditions. Yeah. Yeah, terrible conditions, and, and their final minutes are absolutely awful. They're it's, horrifying, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. that's how it all led up for me, is all those reasons and then some. Now, of course, I, I, I think we all can come to conclusions on how you came up with the name, but I'm always interested to find out just to, to how the whole origin of coming up with the name Geminis came to mind and how you said, you know what, that's what we're going to call it. <laughs> well, you know, we were doing brainstorming back and forth, and it was actually um, one of my partners who just went, oh, my God, Jiminy's. <laughs> and then I was like, there's no way we're going to be able to get that name. There's no way. <laughs> and then I did a little bit of research, and it turns out that the expression Jiminy Cricket 
goes way back into the 1800s when people used to um, not want to take the Lord's name in vain. And so they thought saying Jesus Christ was like saying a swear word. So they started saying Jiminy Christmas, Jiminy Cricket uh, instead. And so, you know, I, of course, I, I was worried about Disney. Yeah. And uh, but but because it goes back that far, we we were fine. It's just an expression, and we were able to trademark it, so we were super excited. And, but it's also if if you look at the logo, I don't know if you you actually really looked at it. Um, there's a nod to the cricket, just in the way that we did Jiminy's. The the J is the back leg, yes. and the apostrophe is the antenna. <laughs> I did notice that, and I thought that was really cool. I wasn't sure if you just used a really cool you create a font or if that was just <laughs> all pre planned. I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, no, that's, it's a nod to the cricket. Oh, all right. Well, I didn't, I, you know, I wasn't entirely sure. I thought it was a very unique J. So I was like, okay. <laughs> and it's funny because I always like to say cheese and crackers, um, just for the fun of it, just because it's just funny. But I didn't actually know the whole Jiminy Cricket. I didn't put that one together. And so that would actually yeah. be public domain then. That, that would, out there for almost kind of royalty free. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really old expression. So <laughs> I didn't mean, even know when it first started, but they, it you know when you do the little origin search, it's, it says eighteen hundreds. <laughs> interesting. Well, that's why I always like the origin stories for everything because it it really does you know dissect everything down, and then you find out the most unique stories behind it, which I didn't know that. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, I was actually really, I, I, I have to say, I was really worried about Disney, <laughs> but b- believe it or not, I, I happened to be flipping channels, and I came across Snow White, and Snow White was made in, I believe, 1940, and um, Pinocchio was made in 43 or something like that, and as the dwarfs are approaching the bed when Snow White is, you know, when she's asleep across all their beds at the beginning. Right. And they, they think it's a monster laying there. One of the dwarfs goes, Jiminy Crickets. And I was like, okay, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely an expression. <laughs> there you go. I mean, yeah. it's funny. It's funny, though, if you ever really think about it. I'm definitely guilty of this. I probably know more about Disney history than I do about U.S. history, which is probably sad. That's <laughs> well, we all grew up on it, so, you know. I still, to this day, am pretty much growing up on it, even though I've, I'm have i a full adult. I don't think mentally I've ever been able to <laughs> elevate. <laughs> so, any plans on exploring other insects to add to biscuits or to something else? It's definitely one of the things that we've put on the the roadmap, but it's a little further out on the roadmap. Um, You know, our plan is we're we're adding in another uh, form of treat this year, so the soft and chewy, and that'll come out around Super Zoo. And then um, we're working on food, which uh, will likely come the following year, and then cat. Uh, is is kind of the plan. Now, what we'd love to do is start to layer in some of the other insects, but, you know, every time we do it, we have to go through a process with, with AFCO, which is, you know, it's a lot of work and expensive. But I am very bullish about some of the other insects because, like, for instance, mealworms, they have more fat than uh, than a cricket. And when you think about, like, puppies or, um, or you know, nursing mothers, it might make a lot of sense to do a mix of cricket and mealworm for, for you know, those kind of life stages. I could see where that would work. I mean, I'm just the proteins, the irons, and of course, you know, the fat, especially when, when a puppy needs it and a nursing mother is definitely losing something every single time she's she's nursing. So, yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. When you think of the science. I, I'm running down the science in my brain going, yeah, okay, that goes for it. <laughs> that does happen. Um, is there anything we didn't cover? Because, I mean, I I find this to be a very interesting topic. Yeah, oh, wow, we've covered a lot. Um, yeah, I, I think we've covered most of it. I mean, um, you know, unless you've got questions about a specific area, but, um, you know, we're just so bullish about what we're doing here. We We feel passionately that this is the right thing to do. Um, you know, moving into the future, it, it, 
it just makes sense to to start feeding our dogs differently. Mm -hmm. And it's for me, it's a way to ease Americans into this as a new protein source. And I like doing it with dogs for another reason as well. If you think about it, um, if I was to do a, a treat for a person, I might get one or two eating occasions per week. But as I move into dog food, you get 80 to 90% of their diet. And if you're able to get water savings against that, you've just made a huge difference. The impact is, is kind of incredible. And in such a uncertain time when it comes to, you know, being in California, I remember what that was like. Even going down to Hoover Dam and seeing the water levels on how low it is and where it should have yeah. been, that's kind of frightening. You're going, ooh, that's not good. Yeah, and you see that in all the rivers. We have a, we go to a river and right now it is super low and this is the time of year when it should be high. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's scary. It is. Yeah, we need to come up with better, better alternatives. And again, feeding our, our pets is definitely something we all have to look at is there's, there's definitely a, a movement and an adjustment that we all have to make. And there's just nothing against the idea of insects. I mean, it makes more sense. Again, what are you going to do with the, the cricket once it passes? Throw it away? I mean, at least you're, you're actually using it. So it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And more than, more than makes sense. I think it's, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Well, you're taking something that it lived, it had its life, and you're, come on, it's, it's being repurposed. And if a dog is out there on the, in the wild, let's take it back to, you know, it's, primitive oh, yeah. feed. It's going to eat bugs. Oh, yeah. They definitely do. There's there's lots of evidence of dogs foraging. In fact, mm-hmm. um, so there's some studies that show it having um, as much as 50% of its diet coming from insects, uh, especially during certain times of years, mm-hmm. year when that that's what they were able to, you know, to, to find. Mm-hmm. Well, that's just it. I mean, if they were licking, let's say they were licking a leaf or, or a tree because there was some liquid on there and they were thirsty, and a bug was in that area, well, what is going to happen? It's going to ingest the bug. I look at, again, back to my cats. They love when a spider or something gets around. But I can honestly say a dog, my dogs will come over, and they're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And sometimes they get the actual spider before the actual cat does. And you can see on the cat's face, like, that was mine. I was still hunting. (laughs) Yeah. I guess the holy grail for a cat is if you could do a treat that actually moved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but then you'd have the unfortunate pet parent that's like, oh my god, it's moving! But, <laughs> yeah, it could happen. Well, thank you, Anne, for being on. I really do appreciate it, and, and come back anytime, tell us more. I, I as, as I told you even before, I definitely love the science behind this, and I think you're doing a great job. Oh, thank you so much. It was my pleasure. It, it has been an absolute, absolute delight. <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm Chris Green. Have a fantastic week. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay, gotta go in my bedtime.